Welcome to First Baptist Sparta, and thank you for watching our worship service online. We hope that the hearing of the Word today leaves your faith strengthened and encouraged, and we hope that you'll make plans to come visit us in person soon. For more information about the church, you can either contact the church directly or visit SpartaFirstBaptist.com. If you've got your Bible, you can open it up to Acts chapter 5. We're going to be in Acts chapter 5 this morning, verses 27 through 42, as we continue our study through the book of Acts. Last week, we started this two-part story with the apostles, all 12 of the apostles, being arrested for the second time by the Jewish officials. They were preaching Jesus in the temple, which they had already been warned not to do. And so they were arrested, they were put in jail, but what we saw last week is that while the Jewish leaders were meeting and plotting about what they were going to do with the apostles, an angel came into the prison, and with the doors locked and the guards present, led a jailbreak. The angel told them to continue the mission, to go back to the temple, preaching in the name of Christ. And that's what the apostles did. When the Jewish leaders realized what's going on, they, they have to go back to the temple, arrest them again, and that's where we pick up the story today. With the twelve apostles standing before the Jewish council, answering questions about their act of civil disobedience. So stand, if you will, in honor of the reading of God's Word, Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody. And a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew, drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man... It will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day, in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Let's pray. Now, this is your word, what an inspiring word it is. But I pray that it wouldn't just inspire us like a motivational speech. I pray that it would inspire us with heartfelt courage and heartfelt joy. That we would go out into the world shining the light of Christ. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's the main idea this morning. Trust in God's sovereign power and plan enables believers to live with courage and suffer with joy. Trust in God's sovereign power and plan enables believers to live with courage and suffer with joy. One of the most common questions we ask our kids is this. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? 
when you're screaming at me because I won't let you have your fourth brownie, do you trust me? When I tell you to wait 15 minutes, and after that, I will come look at the fort you built, do you trust me? Do you trust that I'll keep my word? When we go to the doctor, and you have to get shots that hurt like crazy, but ultimately are for your good, do you trust me? Why is trust so important? Because trust transforms our perspective. Here's what trust does. I can't understand why a fourth brownie isn't a good idea. I can't. Seems like a good idea to me. Brownies taste great. But if you say that it is, I trust you. I trust you. And instead of complaining, I can move forward in joy and contentment with the rest of my life. So complaining becomes contentment. How? Because of trust. Or, I can't understand why the doctor stabbing me with a needle is a good idea. But if you say it is, mom and dad, I know that you love me, and if you say that it is, I trust you. And instead of kicking and screaming and freaking out and hyperventilating, which is what all of our kids do, <laughs> I'll face my fears with courage. Why? Because I trust you. I trust you. It still hurts. I'm still going to cry. But if you say it's good for me, then I'll endure the pain with joy. So trusting God allows us to face fearful situations with courage and painful situations with joy. That's where we're going today. So point number one. Trust in God's sovereign power enables believers to live with courage. Look at verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So there's two accusations here. The first is, we told you to stop talking about Jesus, and you did the opposite. Right? Not only have you continued teaching in his name, but they said you have filled the whole city with your teaching. Oh, that we, as First Baptist Sparta, might be charged with such an accusation. You have filled the town of Sparta with your teaching. North, east, south, west, from Piney to Elkin. Every inch of Allegheny County filled with the teaching of Jesus because of you. Wouldn't that be a wonderful statement? So that's the first accusation. We told you to stop. You did the opposite. But look at the second accusation, verse 28. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. In other words, you keep publicly blaming us for the death of Jesus. Now, that is a true accusation, right? Every time Peter preaches, this is like his primary preaching point. Acts chapter 2, this Jesus, you crucified and killed. <coughs> Acts chapter 3, you killed the author of life. Acts chapter 4, this Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. Peter has been unapologetic in pointing his finger at the Jewish leaders and <coughs> saying, you were responsible for the death of Jesus. Not solely responsible. There were other people involved. Pilate, Herod, the Roman soldiers. They played their part as well. It was both Jew and Gentile that conspired against Jesus. But the Jews and the Jewish leaders specifically were key players in the plot. Now Peter doesn't pull this accusation out of thin air. Listen to what the people in Jerusalem said just prior to Jesus' crucifixion. is in Matthew 27, 24 and 25. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, you remember Pilate knows Jesus is innocent, he's trying to figure out a way to, to set him free. When Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. In other words, Pilate, you don't want the blame? You don't want to be held responsible for this? That's fine. Blame us. 
Hold us responsible. Hold us accountable. His blood be on us and on our children. So Peter is absolutely justified in his preaching, and he says so in his response. So in verses 29 and 30, Peter responds to both of the accusations. Look first in verse 29. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. So this is his first response to the first accusation. We told you to stop preaching in the name of Christ, and you didn't obey. Why? Because we must obey God rather than men. The problem isn't that we didn't hear you. The problem is that ultimately we don't answer to you. Now there's a consistent teaching throughout the New Testament that does require and command Christians to submit to earthly authorities. Romans 13.1 Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. 1 Peter 2.13 Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. Even Jesus says... Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But the second half of Jesus' sentence in that teaching puts boundaries on Christian submission to government. Jesus says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but give to God what belongs to God. So what Jesus, Paul, and Peter all three agree on is that when the commands of God come into conflict with the commands of government... Our final allegiance belongs to God. Now Peter continues with his response to the second accusation. Verse 30. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. And God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. So the Jewish leaders are like, hey. Why do you keep trying to pin this man's death on us? Why do you keep trying to put his blood on our hands? And here Peter is doing it again. He says, you killed him. You hung him on a tree. Now when Peter says that, he's referencing a passage from Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24 says, Curse is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that's what the Jewish leaders were saying about Jesus. And Peter's telling them, your opinion of Jesus was that he was cursed. But God's opinion of Jesus, exalted. You cursed him, but God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior. So here's the fundamental problem for the Jewish leaders, and it's the fundamental problem for a lot of people in the world today. They disagree with God about who Jesus is. God doesn't say that Jesus was merely a prophet. God doesn't say that Jesus is a good teacher. God doesn't say that Jesus is a nice guy who makes your life better. God says that Jesus is leader. Some of your translations say prince, ruler, king. He's leader. And he's Savior. When people stand in the waters of baptism, in the baptistry, what do we ask them? What is your profession of faith? In other words, what is the basis of your salvation? What do you believe? And it may be my favorite words to hear as a pastor. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to agree with God about who Jesus is. He is Lord of the universe and Lord of my life. I am following Jesus. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. I have surrendered my life into his hands and will do whatever my king requires of me. He is Lord. And yet there's something a little one-dimensional about Jesus being Lord. You might make the mistake of thinking that the relationship with Jesus is solely rooted in authority and obligation. You might make the mistake of thinking that, that your relationship with Jesus is motivated by fear and force. So don't miss the second title. It gives us a fuller sense of his lordship. 
This isn't just about submission and obedience and law. It's about love. He is Lord and He is Savior. At the heart of who Jesus is, He is a rescuer. He is a Savior. Can y'all put your thinking caps on with me for a second? Are y'all are y'all awake? <laughs> All right. I want to give you two ideas that we're going to contrast in our heads. All right. Here's the two ideas: Savior, which is who Jesus is, and self-help. Savior versus self-help. Now there are a lot of different flavors of Christianity in the world, right? Yeah, we believe the Bible. Yeah, we we believe in Jesus. But there's a lot of different flavors to that. The flavor I try to taste like is biblical Christianity. But there's a flavor of Christianity out in the world today that I would call self-help Christianity. It dominates the Christian bookstore shelves. And here's the underlying story that that flavor is rooted in. You are a good person. But life is hard. And as you live your life trying to be a good person you're inevitably going to bump up against difficult situations, right? You're going to have your patience tested. You're going to have your faith tested. You're going to have your joy tested. And so what you need to do is, is you need to stay close to Jesus because Jesus is your life coach. Jesus is your personal trainer, right? I need a personal trainer. Someone who will tell me to wake up and go to the gym and do my workouts. And that's what Jesus is in self-help Christianity. He's right there beside you, cheering you on. Be patient. Choose joy. Keep the faith. You can do it. So if life is a pool, you're an okay swimmer, but you need a swim coach who will help you swim stronger in the face of adversity. That is self-help Christianity. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. In that version, in that flavor of Christianity, Jesus is a helper, not a savior. He's a helper, not a savior. The word savior implies desperation. The word savior implies hopeless peril. And for Jesus to be the savior, it implies that He's the hero of the story, not the sidekick to your story. So here's how I believe the Bible presents Jesus as Savior. You're not an okay swimmer who needs a swim coach. You're lying dead, having drowned at the bottom of the pool. You are hopelessly and helplessly sunk. So you don't need a swim coach. They can cheer you on all they want, but you're going nowhere because you're sunk at the bottom of the pool. You don't need a coach. You need a lifeguard. You need someone to jump in the pool, drag you out, and bring you back to life. And that's how Ephesians chapter 2 describes our salvation. It says in Ephesians 2, 1, that you were dead. Circle that word, dead. You were dead in the bottom of the pool, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. But that God, the Savior, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, He made us alive together with Christ. He brought us back to life. Christ is more than just a helper. He is a Savior. Apart from Him, you can do nothing. And without Him, there is no salvation. According to verse 31, he's the only one that can bring repentance and forgiveness of sins. Now, if you're the Jewish leaders listening to Peter's speech here, how might you respond? Here's how I would kind of expect them to respond. Wow! What wonderful news! We can be forgiven? We can even be forgiven of crucifying the Son of God? And if you can be forgiven of that, you can be forgiven of anything. That's what you'd expect. But what is their response? Verse 33. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. 
Now, part of the reason for their offense is because of who they are. Who are these people? They are the Jewish leaders. They are the most outwardly moral religious people in all of Israel. Which goes to show that you can be a moral religious person and not know God. You can be a moral religious person and not know Jesus. Knowing God isn't about religious piety or prestigious positions in the church. Knowing God is about knowing Christ. Period. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you have known me, you have known the Father. The Jewish leaders didn't. So it didn't matter how religious they were, or how pious they were, or how good they were at obeying the Ten Commandments, they were guilty of opposing God, because they were guilty of opposing Jesus. Now why would they oppose Jesus? This is a better question. Why would this news about who Jesus is and what he's done, he's brought repentance and forgiveness of sins, why does this make them rage with anger? Here's the problem with Jesus being Lord and Savior. It's not actually a problem, but some people think it's a problem. Lord? Lord? I don't surrender my life or my rights to anybody. I will maintain ownership of my life. I will sit on the throne of my heart. I don't need a Lord and Savior. Do I look like someone who needs a Savior? I can take care of myself, thank you. I can swim for myself, thank you. Jesus' claims about who he is require humility. Humility. We must humble ourselves before him. And the Jewish leaders can't do it. When the gospel is preached, when sin is confronted, like Peter confronted them, you killed them. Those who are humble rejoice at the mercy and grace of God. And others harden their hearts in prideful anger towards God. Which response describes you this way? Now throughout this whole interaction with the Jewish leaders, we see it again, not just with Peter and John, but all the apostles, they display incredible courage. They go on preaching in the temple even after they're warned not to. When they get called in for questioning, they don't back down. They continue preaching the truth in the face of their opponents. They're not bullied into silence. And so where does this courage come from? Where does this courage come from? There's a Canadian psychology professor who also works as a, a clinical psychologist. He helps people with their anxiety and depression and ambition, career. He was under a lot of scrutiny from the government in Canada and from academia in Canada because he held some very unpopular beliefs about transgenderism. And he stated those beliefs publicly. Not hatefully, but honestly. And it cost him his reputation in academia. The Canadian government is now threatening to revoke his license to practice as a clinician. And somebody asked him in an interview, what gave you the courage? What gave you the bravery to stand up and speak out like you did, knowing what you stood to lose? And here's what he said, his words. Now, I didn't preachify these words. These are his words. There's a line in the Bible. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it's not that I'm courageous. It's that I'm afraid of the right things. It's not so much courage. It's that it's less risky to say something true and deal with the consequences than it is to remain silent when you know there's something to be said. That same thing is what's happening in the hearts of the apostles. Ironic, their courage in this situation comes from their fear of the Lord. They fear God more than they fear man. The weight of what God has told them to do vastly outmeasures the weight of what man has told them not to do. Jesus said in Matthew 
Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear men who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. What's the worst thing a man can do to you? Well, they can kill you. Well, that sounds pretty bad. But not as bad as losing your soul. Do not fear man who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, Jesus says, fear God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So they're able to go on speaking the name of Christ because they trust the sovereign power of God. That his sovereign authority over all things outweighs the puny power of man. And their reverence for his power gives them the courage to say, we must obey God rather than man. So, while this group of Jewish leaders is fuming, filled with rage, wanting to kill the apostles, one Pharisee, we find out, stands up. He tries to bring down the temperature in the room. Point number two. Trust in God's sovereign plan enables believers to suffer with joy. Verse 34. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. To have a closed door meeting. Now, a couple of things about Gamaliel. First, his influence in this time period was so significant that there are ancient Jewish historical records that talk about how revered he was amongst the Jews. He was very respected, very knowledgeable, a man of high standing and high character in the Jewish community. We also know from Acts 20.22 20, that Gamaliel was the rabbi and mentor of the Apostle Paul. In fact, it's commonly believed that Paul is in this meeting as a Pharisee, and that he's the one that would later give Luke the details of what was said in this closed-door session. And here's what Gamaliel says, verse 35. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you're about to do with these men. Be careful. Be careful. For before these days, Thaedas rose up, claiming to be somebody. He was a nobody, but he claimed to be somebody. And a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So Gamaliel is a student of history, and he uses these two history lessons as a way of protecting the group from doing something foolish. They've seen this pattern before, and it always plays out the same way. There's a big movement. We know from history that there were many so-called messiahs in Jesus' day. So there's a movement that gains a following, but when the leader dies, the movement dies. So before we go crazy, Gamaliel says, before we kill these men and bring Jerusalem into an uprising and invite the scrutiny of the Romans, let's just wait and see what happens. Their leader is dead. We crucified him. It's only a matter of time before the movement dies with him. And then he gives one caveat in verse 38. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan, sorry for that word plan, if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. What Gamaliel is referring to here is the doctrine of divine providence. That God has a sovereign plan for all things and nothing and no one can stop what God has sovereignly appointed to happen. Now, as you see from Gamaliel's perspective, we can't see the plan the way God does. We can't see how the events of today are going to play out and play into his bigger plan for five years from now, ten years from now, a hundred years from now. And that ignorance about God's plan is the basis of his appeal. He says, guys, we don't know what's going to happen. But there's enough going on here with the apostles to at least give us some pause. Right? They are healing people. 
People are dying in their church services. They've gained a big following. We don't know where this is going. And if it is of God, there's nothing we can do to stop it. So why try? And according to verse 39, his speech works. It says, so they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And they let them go. Now you might read verse 39 and think to yourself, wow. God protected them. They got off with a little slap on the wrist. But that would underestimate the meaning of that word, beat. This is not the scourging that Jesus took before his crucifixion. But most likely, it's a reference to what was known in Judaism as the 40 lashes minus one. 39 hits on the back or chest with a whip. And that number 39, I've heard it, you know, reading it throughout the New Testament, as a Christian, but it didn't really stick with me until I started thinking about spanking our kids. Seriously, can you imagine spanking or hitting, punching someone 39 times? I started doing it on my hand. You get to six and you're like, oh my goodness. I couldn't imagine being hit or hitting 39 times. This was a severe beating. In fact, it's, it's reasonable to assume, based on what we see in Acts chapter 7, where Stephen is stoned, that this is the final warning before more extreme measures are taken, a.k.a. death. So imagine that you've just been beaten badly for teaching in the name of Jesus. You've been beaten badly for being obedient. Forget a spanking, that's for disobedience. You've been beaten for being obedient, how would you feel? Maybe you feel discouraged. God, this is what I can get for being obedient? Thanks a lot. Maybe you feel afraid. There is no way I'm going back into that temple to preach. I'm going to sit at home, I'm going to do my Bible study, and I'm going to be quiet. Maybe you start doubting. Is this really worth it? It's really worth it. When you consider turning back, when you consider shutting up, but look at verse 41. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing. Rejoicing? That has to be a typo. It's supposed to say they left the presence of the council weeping, or they left the presence of the council complaining. How are they rejoicing? I think there's two things at play here. Number one, even though the apostles are suffering, they trust in God's providence. They trust in God's plan, the plan that Gamaliel was talking about. And for the apostles, there was no if. You remember what Gamaliel said? If this is of God. For the apostles, it was, we know this is of God. We were eyewitnesses of Christ's ministry and his resurrection. We are recipients of the Holy Spirit and have seen his power at work among the church. God's got a plan. And we may not know how our suffering fits into it, but what we do know is that we're going to be obedient and let the chips fall where they may because God's in charge of the chips. That's how they can rejoice in their suffering. But there's something else going on here. Look at verse 41 again. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing in what? That they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Now here's my question. Isn't that a contradiction? That's like saying you're proud of being humiliated. Those two things don't go together. How can you be counted worthy to suffer dishonor, to suffer shame? Like imagine if at awards day at the high school, they honored the top 10% of the class by making them scrub the floor with toothbrushes. Those two things don't go together. So what's happening? Here's what's happening. Every era has certain trends that identify you with the in-crowd 
Uh, there's certain clothes you can wear, certain hairstyles you can have, certain cars that you can drive. Like if you're a high school guy in today's world, maybe this has always been the case. The bigger your truck, the cooler you are. It's just how it goes. There's, there's certain things that communicate to other people. I'm with the in crowd. Look at my clothes. Look at my car. That's a marker of status. But throughout the history of the church, the proof that Christians have given to prove that they're in with Jesus is not, look at my clothes, look at my car, let's look at my scars. In Galatians 6, Paul is defending his authority, his apostolic authority. People are questioning him about whether or not he's legit. And here's how he defends himself and his ministry. Galatians 6, 17. It says, from now on, let no one calls me trouble. Leave me alone. <laughs> For I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The reason the apostles rejoiced in their suffering isn't because it, ident it identified them with status, but it identified them with their Savior. The American church has mostly adopted the view that if we're suffering, we must be doing something wrong. But for New Testament Christians, it was the opposite. If we are suffering for Jesus, it's because we're doing something right. And so rather than discouraging them, the beating fueled them. Verse 42. And every day, where'd they go? In the temple. And from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. We've seen this before, but I want to keep pointing it out every time it comes up. What are they teaching and preaching? What is the fundamental message of Christianity? What has been the topic of every single sermon so far in Acts? They're preaching Christ. Christianity is Christ. They're not preaching lists of rules. They're not preaching morality. They're not preaching about following the Ten Commandments. They're not preaching about giving money to charity. That's not the focus of, of their preaching. Why? Because those things aren't Christianity. They may be the outflow of Christianity and the fruit of Christianity. But Christianity is fundamentally about Jesus. What do you do with Jesus? Have you surrendered to him as Lord of your life? And have you received him as Savior sin. If you've never done that today, that's your application. Surrender your life to Christ today. Trust Him as Savior from sin today. Not helper, Savior. You must have Him. And if you've already done that, here's your application question for today. Is your trust in God producing courageous obedience and joyful suffering? Come back to where we started. Trust. Where does courageous obedience come from? It comes from trusting in God's power over man's power. Trusting in God's words more than man's words. Valuing the words of God more than the words of men. Fearing God more than you fear men. And where does joyful suffering come from? It comes from trusting in God's sovereign plan. We're just like Gamaliel. We can't see the future. We don't know what's going to happen. But we can trust that whatever happens, God is working all things together according to the counsel of his will. And we can say with Paul, this should be your life verse. All right, if you have a life verse, get rid of it and get this one. <laughs> Philippians 1, 20 and 21. It is my eager expectation and hope, Paul says. When Paul writes this, he's in prison. And he doesn't know what the future holds. More prison, beatings, or freedom. What's going to happen? I don't know. But it is my eager expectation and hope that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. None of us know what tomorrow holds. Our only desire whether it's a car accident or a cancer diagnosis.
whether you get fired from your job, or your spouse walks out the door, or you get beaten with 40 lashes minus one. Our only desire should be that Christ is honored in my body, whether by life or by death, good or bad, freedom or prison. And when that's your desire, you have an unshakable courage and an unshakable joy. Unshakable because it's not dependent on your circumstances, but on Christ. Christ is sufficient for you in life and in death. <clears throat> Commenting on this passage, one pastor said this. The promise of the gospel isn't that you get help or that you get wealth. Just ask the apostles after they finish taking their beating. The gospel isn't that you get health or that you get wealth. The gospel is that you get Jesus and He is enough. Do you know Jesus like that this morning? Is He enough for you? To give you unshakable courage and unshakable joy. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I just wonder if there's anyone in here this morning that would say, I don't know Jesus like that. I don't know Jesus as Lord. I know him as advisor. He gives me some suggestions. But I don't know him as Lord. I haven't surrendered my life to him. I've been following my own way, not his way. I don't know him as Savior. made a, a mess of your life and you're here this morning and you just need to say, I am a sinner, I am guilty, and I need Jesus to wash away my sin. There is nothing that self-help can do for your past. There's a little bit of self-help hope for the future. You can change. But there is nothing self-help can do for your past. And yet Jesus washes away the sins of the past in order to bring true hope and true transformation for the future. If that's you this morning, if you need to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, I want to ask you during the invitation to come down the front and talk to me. I'll be down at the front as we sing. I would love to, to pray with you, to hear your story. Maybe there's others of you who need to pray privately here at the altar, right there at your seats. However the Lord leads you in this moment, I ask you to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's lead. God, I pray that you would help us to see. Help us to see ourselves as we truly are. Help us to see our need for Christ, Lord and Savior. And help us to depend on Christ and to trust Him in such a way that we have an unshakable courage and an unshakable joy. Pray these things in Jesus' name.